Okay, go for it. Good day, everyone. I'm Anthea Adams. On behalf of the Altasa executive team, I would like to welcome you to our webinar on assessment for emergency remote teaching. Now, this is a collaboration between two of our collaborative learning communities, uh, professional development and technology enhanced learning. Thank you so much for making time in your busy schedules to join us today. Uh, we are pleased to have most of our institutions represented here. We also have colleagues from the rest of Africa and the rest of the world joining us today. So you are most welcome. We have five panelists who will share ideas on how the institutions have transitioned to assessment for remote teaching. Now they will reflect on some of the lessons they have learned and offer practical advice to us. After the presentations, we will have a Q&A session. In the meantime, you're most welcome to use the chat to co comment and also to pose questions. Now the conveners of the two CLCs, Dr. Rosalind Govender and Dr. Nicola Pallet, will now introduce our panelists. Thank you, Rosalind. Thank you, Anthea, and welcome. Yeah, we've, as I said earlier, we've got representation from universities from across South Africa, public and private. And we've also got teachers and students that are joining us today. Uh, special welcome to colleagues from eEmerge Africa, uh, colleagues from um, institutions across Africa, and we've got also um, out of Africa, like Malaysia. So welcome to those colleagues as well. So our first panelist for today is Dr. Raymond Imakako. Uh, Dr. Raymond is a senior academic developer with the Center for Teaching and Learning at the Northwest University. His new projects are to coordinate faculty representatives who are responsible for grounded data generation used for planning professional development opportunities for staff on pedagogies. Dr. Raymond is the faculty lead for the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences and conducts research in leadership, faculty advising, and teaching and learning in basic and higher education in South Africa. Dr. Raymond recently became the convener of the subtle, um, the Haltasa Subtle PLC, and he's an executive member of Haltasa with a portfolio on special projects. So very, very warm welcome to Raymond. Over to you, Raymond. Yeah, thanks, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'll just share my screen quickly. And um, just to show my face, everyone, this is Raymond, all right? So I'll share my screen in a moment and then we can pr pr proceed. Can you see my screen now? Yep. Yes, Perfect. Raymond, we can. Okay, good. Now, thank you for the introduction. Um, good morning, colleagues from all over South Africa. And if anyone has also logged in from outside South Africa, good morning to you too. Uh, I would really just like to uh, you know, say a big thank you to Otasa Professional Development and Technological um, CLC, you know, and this brilliant initiatives of sharing amongst ourselves our challenges with emergency remote teaching and with a focus on assessment. Um, a, a big gratitude to the leadership of this um, CLC, Dr. Rosalind and Nicola, and of course the entire team for organization of this event. Thank you. Um, that being said, I will take you through how the Northwest University has transitioned on assessment and um, relates um, its related challenges that it, we encountered along the way, and some practical advice that I, uh, I think would be applicable to most institutions of higher learning. All right, um, here's what we did at the Northwest University. Here's what we did at the Northwest University on assessment in our emergency remote teaching. Upon the, presidential, the president's announcement, the university had to put in motion adjustment plan 
which are subject to changes and directives from the national government. At the Northwest University, two notable things happened immediately and simultaneously, actually, um, focusing on teaching, learning, and assessment. The first was a stance at losing the academic year was not an option. So there was a series of meetings with all teaching and learning stakeholders internally and ex externally on the way forward. And secondly, was the development of a living document, uh, which is still a living document now, which was uh, called the Emergency COVID-19 Assessment Strategy Plan um, by the Center for Teaching and Learning. So I would actually start with the assessment plan for um, the Center for Teaching and Learning. Now the assessment strategy plan, the assessment strategy plan um, is a set of recommendations and guiding framework on assessment practices and address matters such as university response directive, parameters for teaching, learning and assessment, ensuring that all recommendations are viable for both staff and students, uh, keeping to the principle of assessment and institutional policies on teaching, learning and assessment. And lastly, uh, ensured consideration was given to access to devices of students um, and internet. Now, some of the examples of these parameters in the assessment strategy plan was the need for a reconfigured 2020 academic framework. Assessment support to faculties regarding remote teaching, an evaluation of current assessment state on what has been done um, before uh, the presidential announcement and what can be waived or even changed. And that's when we started talking about reweighting of assessment. Um, another part was assessment mode changes, monitoring of online assessment strategies to ensure for quality and communication of any form of amendment on assessment to colleagues and students. During this time, consideration was given to the possibility of not having a sit-down exam, which was awaiting, of course, university management directive. However, the focus of the assessment plan was towards reweighting and or even redesign and then digitalization. At this time, CTL offered professional development opportunities for online teaching, learning and assessment. Um, out of this strategy plan, um, the university management um, then asked that all faculty um, review and develop assessment plans, uh, which was then based on a series of consultations. Faculty were asked to review and adapt their assessment plans and develop assessment plans that are fit for remote teaching, learning and assessment, which was presented to Senate at that time. And with CTL's document analysis of all faculty assessment plans, we have eight faculties, it resulted in perhaps following a continuous assessment approach, which um, was not at that point mandatory, but it was the most suitable approach to follow since it was not, since it was also announced that there would be no sit down exam already for the June um, 2020 examination, according to the university calendar. Now, for the continuous assessment, all lecturers were then expected to assess based on an amended assessment plan in their respective faculties and schools, since discipline context consideration had to be given. During this time, a notable challenge was that not all students had access to devices and internet. Um, needed for remote teaching, even though there were extensive efforts on this infrastructure distribution. By the Sorry, University. Raymond, can I interrupt you quickly? Yes. Um, one of the participants has just in, uh, indicated that uh, your, your, uh, it, it, uh, your, your speech just uh, implies that you have a slide share going, or are you just showing one slide? Okay, um, I thought it was... Okay, and your slides weren't advancing. 
Sorry yeah, about it's that. Not advancing yet. Yes, I'm still on this slide. Oh, okay. So it's, you haven't advanced it yet. Okay, great. Cool. Thank you. Now, um, I will just continue from where I stopped. Now, during this time, a notable challenge was that not all students had access to devices, right? So th this led management to decide on paper-based and remote teaching, learning, and assessment, and also winter schooling. Um, the winter schooling was to give an additional grace period to complete assessment. I'll get to that in a moment. Now, um, for the teaching of uh, at, in the remote platform and the paper-based teaching, surveys indicated that some students had no hmm. asset. So the university made no? effort to purchase devices and data for students, but could not reach all student needs. Management insisted that no student must be left behind. So there was need for them for them to develop hard copies of paper materials. These study materials included tutorial letters, assessment packs, and readers, which was then shipped to the physical addresses of all identified students. The winter school in itself was a grace period that Northwest University offers to the paper-based assessment group of students. It is to help those students who could not participate in the assessments during the COVID-19 or couldn't send back the assessment or assignment in the first place. This is also meant to help the completion of practical modules during teaching and assessment. Now, in this first slide, I've been able to note some challenges, but I would just like to highlight some key challenges um, as I go forward. Now, the, in, the, in this slide, an attempt is made to outline some challenges experienced at the Northwest University. The first is the weighting of assessment. Since the decision was made that there will be no semester tests and sit down exams, assessment plans needed to be revised and assessment reweight. Many lecturers had not assessed all modal outcomes when the pandemic broke out. So there was a need to redesign final examinations um, which is summative assessment into other alternative forms of assessment. A whole lot of webinars were conducted during this time. For assessment designs, they were concerned on how to incorporate assessment of and for learning in continuous assessment since they have intentional purpose in assessment practices. As for academic integrity, concerns were raised about how to ensure academic in integrity regarding assessment in remote learning. This was raised by many lecturers across campuses in one-on-one -on -one consultations and in drop-in drop rooms. We result into um, practical tips into the design stages of assessment as a training opportunity and also included an academic integrity pledge, which was integrated as part of all online assessment. So before students would actually do or submit any assessment, they need to submit a pledge. Moderation, as you know, um, ensures validity and reliability of assessment. It was important to ensure that the continuous assessment given to students were moderated. A revised online moderators report was developed as a guideline to be used for the period or the duration of the teaching learning and assessment. The, the last challenge was on the functional was an issue since not all existing models in our programs had them. There was pressure on professional support staff to make all models ready on the LMS site, if only. Instructional designers and educational technologies worked towards this. In addition, videos were created to help lecturers as this were generic in nature, so they can always watch the video and then carry that out. To help with these challenges, an assessment tax team was set up to take lead on assessment related matters through a series of webinars, through lunch hour discussion, and they had to review our policies and our rules for teaching, learning, and assessment. 
our educational technologies, academic developers, academic advisors, instructional designers were all allocated to drop in virtual rooms to assist lecturers with assessment related issues, among, amongst others. And a website portal is dedicated to emergency remote teaching where vital information is provided regularly and an alert uh, system is created, you know, to these updates to all staff of the university. So what, what, whenever an information is posted on the web portal, they get an email automatically in their official email um, addresses. So from all this, what I can um, share with uh, other people would be that Apologies, Raymond. I just quickly had to change some settings. You can uh, unmute your mic. Okay. So on, on working advices, it, it's, it's important um, to say that these strategies work well in the Northwest University context. Using these strategies in your institution may still require some form of variable consideration and consultations, you know, considering your organizational and structural setup and even physical, human and financial resources. Key strategies that can assist with assessment practices in remote teaching and learning would include that develop the habit of recording developmental activities rather than having to repeat webinars on various assessment topics. Although the recorded item must be professionally edited before uploading within the university intranet, or if you please, and you want it to go to the internet also. Host a page on your institution website with resources, with helpful resources. This can be used in uploading all recent information on assessment. It provides easy access to lecturers. Thirdly, Host drop-in rooms where lecturers can connect virtually to quickly ask and resolve assessment issues. Most of these requests usually would be technical. Um, collect questions, you know, ask during lunchtime discussion, one-on-one -on -one consultation, webinar chats, um, webinar sections, drop-in rooms to develop frequently asked questions which should be hosted in a resource page, such as a web page. This really saves a lot of time because people will keep asking the same question. And if that has been documented, you can always refer them to, to the frequent, uh, frequently asked question. Lastly, conduct surveys on remote teaching to be informed by the lived experiences of these lecturers, of the students, and even professional support staff. This enables grounded scholarly practice for the further improvements during the period of remote teaching and learning. And um, that's pretty the story at the Northwest University of how we've encountered, experienced it, and um, soared through these challenges. Um, thank you very much. Okay, so I know I've got to enter. Uh, I think I've got to unmute Rosaline. Thank you very much, Raymond. Um, let me just find Rosaline. Sorry about that. We are definitely discovering things as we go. Okay, Rosaline, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Or let me know who's, if it's not Rosaline. Um, okay, I hear a baby cry in the background. Raymond, is it your little one? Oh, yeah, that's, that's my boy. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay, Rosaline, can you unmute?
Hi, everyone. Sorry, um, there was an issue with unmuting here. Thank you very much, Raymond. A uh, lot of interesting ideas coming through, uh, and we will discuss that further. Uh, over to you, Nicola, to introduce Daniela. Sure, thank you, Rosaline. Um, so, Daniela and I, well, I've known Daniela for a long time. Uh, Daniela works at uh, CPUT uh, in the Western Cape. She's an associate uh, professor. Um, yeah, and has been in the educational technology space for a very, very long time and uh, staff development, learning design. She's got a lot of uh, diverse uh, interests and has many publications. So over to you, Daniela. Apologies. So, Daniela, I'm just going to upgrade you. Okay, we see oh, your slide. I now I'm muted. I'm unmuted. Thank you. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, thanks, Nicola, for the introduction. Yes, I work at CPUT in academic staff development. And um, I'd like to talk about briefly about our own practices and experiences when supporting academic staff in moving online. So I'm not going to talk from an institutional perspective, from, but more from a personal perspective as academic staff developer, training and supporting academics at our institution. Um, so at CPUT, we have adopted the term multimodal learning um, rather than remote teaching and learning because from the very beginning, there was a strong emphasis on supporting all sorts of learning. So not just online learning, but also to put an emphasis on print-based learning and also to incorporate face-to-face -face teaching and learning if possible. So this idea of no student is really important in our context. And that also meant that we started quite late with remote teaching and learning. We only started on the 1st of June. We waited until the higher education minister um, issued the, the directive to start on 1st of June. And that was mainly due to the fact to be sure to prepare properly and to understand where our students were, what access they had. So we ran a big survey, a CPT student access survey to understand um, what opportunities or challenges our students are facing at the moment. So, and we also started training lecturers. Um, we've been training them for about two months with nearly daily webinars. Um, and the, the second term started 1st of June until end of July. And so for us, it's only the fourth week. So it's very difficult to talk about lessons learned or practical tips in terms of assessment because we're actually only entering the phase of midterm assessments at the moment. What I can say is that from the beginning, there was an, a strong focus of on using the institutional learning management system Blackboard. We have had um, good adoption of Blackboard before. So we've had our training set up and our courses set up. All, all, all registered students automatically um, added to Blackboard courses. So there has already been a good buy-in in Blackboard. But what we can say is definitely there's a huge increase in, in use of Blackboard. So these are just some stats um, from our learning management system over the last few months. And you can see a huge increase in, these are just four faculties out of the six, but three out of these, you can see a huge increase of Blackboard access and huge since um, the 1st of June. Um, so our institution, very similar to what the previous um, speaker said, also um, asked for a revision of assessment plans. So faculties had to submit revised plans. And I can see some of our faculty members are here. So um, later on in the question and answers, they can also step in. Um, but the kind of very broad guidelines or frame, the very broad framework that was issued to the faculties is that assessment schedules needed to be revised. The learning outcomes should, if possible, stay the same. 
the rating should be the same in terms of assessment, but the methods, the modes of assessments could change. And there was a strong call to integrate assessments, so to provide assessments across different subjects. Um, there was also the opportunity to move away from final assessments for first and second years and rather focus on continuous assessment. But for the final year, um, final years, there had to be a final assessment, mostly the fees that are final um, integrated summative assessment. And that will be on campus. So that's part, for example, the students who have to sit fees as a part of the 33% that can now return to campus. So in terms Sorry, of Daniela, academic, we're getting yeah. lag. Um, we're getting some lag on your side. So can okay. you possibly mute your video? Yes, I will. Thank you. Okay, is this better now? So we, as I mentioned, we had a very a good uptake of Blackboard since, um, even before, but even more so now since um, the lockdown. And we have been offering training on Blackboard since March, um, nearly on a daily basis. We run these two hour webinars and we had anything from 50 to 350 participants using our, um, our learning management system has its own video conferencing software called Collaborate. We also have regular good practice sharing sessions where lecturers are being invited to share uh, their thoughts or ideas or experiences with teaching and learning online. And a lot of our sessions were focused on online assignments, online assessment, the tools that lectures have access to on Blackboard, but also responders that most of our lectures are using the grade center, the retention center to see and identify at risk subjects. We do some, we do have proctoring software, the responders lockdown browser and monitor, but from our experiences that they're quite data heavy and not necessarily ideal for the current um, context. So um, some initial thoughts, um, in terms of what we can see so far from my own conversations with lecturers, the kind of engagement that we had is that lecture definitely offer a lot more flexibility in terms of assessment. They're way more open with deadlines, allowing students also multiple ways of expressing themselves. Um, they offer more and more regular feedback. Um, so it seems like lecturers are um, trying to be a lot more aware and, and, and responsive to their students. I've seen a lot of innovation when it comes to assessment, a lot of creativity in how lecturers have modified their assessments to suit the context. There are less assumptions and there's more listening happening. We have had some institutional surveys on students' access, but also faculty-based surveys, departmental surveys, individual lecturers who are running surveys to understand and to get as much information as possible um, about our students. The Blackboard Retention Center is used a lot more to see who has access, who has missed deadlines, and to respond quickly. There's also a stronger sensitivity towards students' context. So the, the, the idea that it's not just about data, and about devices, although that's important, but that has been kind of taken care of. But there's also other consideration like learning spaces, other spaces where students are based in conducive to learning. What do they need? Um, what kind of support do they need? Although we have been um, strongly advising to um, support mainly asynchronous assessment and to move away from synchronous assessment just because um, it's more flexible and less time sensitive, less resource sensitive. Um, there seems to be quite a lot of, on, of timed quizzes still. So I think it seems to be quite difficult for lecturers to move away from their established practices. But what we can see is that um, they're offering alternatives for, for those who can't access. So even if they might have an online quiz that's open for two hours, if 15%, 20% of the students didn't take it, they will try and offer alternative to those. Um, there is also, um, there are concerns around academic integrity and I mean Blackboard does allow some sort of security like creating passwords, having timings, creating questions pools um, so students get a variety of questions, not all of them get the same. 
but some I can also see are rethinking the nature of assessments. So rather than thinking about how students can cheat or preventing students from cheating, they actually build collaboration um, into their assignments. So they encourage like, students to collaborate and to work together rather than um, punishing them for cheating. But what we can also see that because a lot of students rely on the mobile Blackboard app, um, the app has limited functionalities in terms of assessment. So that's something we have to look into to see how we can work and extend the functionality of the app. I think that's me. Hello. Great, thank you, Daniela. Okay, so just a heads up, folks. I did not, um, well, the closed captioning is a relatively new thing in Zoom. So I didn't set up this meeting room with that in mind. And therefore, I can't seem to enable it on my end. Um, so thanks for folks who have shared <laughs> help resources with me. It's always good that there's a community and everyone seems to be experts now uh, with emergency uh, remote teaching or in Daniela, as you shared in your, your case, calling it multimodal uh, learning. Um, let's just see who is, uh, Ros, if you can just let me know in the chat who's next. Um, so we've had a lot of good questions and I've, I've been trying to collect them. We'll come back to the questions. Um, and then get all our panelists uh, to respond. Okay, Rosalina will unmute you. Thank you, Daniela. Okay, Rose, I see you're on twice. So I don't know which profile, the one with your face or the... Yes, no, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm having internet connection, so I'm always... Um log on to two devices. So thank you so much. Um, I will now introduce Prof. Opa Mashile. Uh, Prof. Mashile is a prof teacher by profession and has been an academic in teacher education at UNISA for over two decades. So he comes to us with a wealth of experience. He has served as the head of teacher education um, and the school of education before joining the Department of Tuition Support and facilitation of learning as an executive director. This department is responsible for, amongst other things, for the professional development of academics at the institution and for student support. His interests are in learning analytics and in capacity development for associate teaching staff. A very, very warm welcome, Prof. Over to you. Okay, Opsana, I've now made you a co-host, so you should be able to share your screen and your mic. You can it's unmute. There we go. It's not me that's meant to be presenting. Sorry. Um, <laughs> okay, so it's not uh, Dr. Opsana who's presenting. Sorry, Rose, Rosaline, just to re remind me. Opa, sorry guys. It's when you're running around Zoom doing many things. Okay, Opa, you are now upgraded. So Opa, you should be able to unmute and to uh, share your screen if you want to, if you've got slides. Opa. Okay, I see your mic is on, but we don't hear you. Yes, uh, hello, can you hear me now? Perfect, thank you, Opa. Okay, great. Um, 
I'm just trying to share and it's, <laughs> it's not allowing me to, to share my screen. I don't know why. Um, I'll, I'll start talking, sorry colleagues, uh, if I manage to, to share, uh, it, will, it will come through. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm struggling to, to, to share. It's going to my system properties and things like that. And okay, there's a little green button um, next to polls. And then you can share, uh, if you click share screen, share which um, one you want. There's a particular, if it's a PowerPoint or a, a screen on a, a window for, from a browser. Yes, I've, I've done that. It's just that it's, it's taking me to system properties that, that's refusing for me to share. I don't know what's happening. Okay, yeah. You, you can always, um, do we want to go to our next speaker and come back to Opa? Yes, please. I, I and then in the meantime, Opa, you can send me, you can email me your slides. I do so. Thank you. Okay, so Shanali, can I hand over to you? Are you ready? Let's just also upgrade Shanali, that will help, hey? <laughs> Sorry, I, I talk aloud. Of course. There we go. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, like it, it muted everybody with a hard mute. Um, thank you very much, Nikki. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. So let me just do a quick intro. So Shanali Govender is from the uh, works in the Center for Innovation in Learning and Teaching. Um, and she's a lecturer in the staff development team. And Shanali, feel free to add to that. So, so Shanali is from the University of Cape Town, UCT. Um, and she's going to be sharing, uh, as you can see, what they've been up to. So over to you, Shanali. <laughs> oh, good. That means you can see my slides. Um, good morning, everybody. And thank you very much for making the time to be here today to think about this. Um, the first thing that I just want to start by saying is that everything that I'm about to say is contingent and partial. So UCT is the kind of institution where even when there are uh, large blanket decisions made across the institution, people do their own version of their own thing. Um, so this is only a kind of centralized or generalized representation. Um, different things may happen in different parts of the university all the time. I suspect that this is true for many universities, um, but definitely it is, it's particularly true on our campus. So some of the things is a kind of framing uh, around assessment. UCT made a decision to, I'm calling it continue-ish teaching, because it definitely wasn't a case that we were able to continue teaching in the way that we had previously. There were two kinds of spaces to this. Uh, the first was a kind of online response, which involved ramping up use of the institutional LMS, which is a Sakai-based ruler. Um, and associated with that, trying to get devices to students who needed them as soon as possible. And the second kind of thread to this was a remote thread, which was in response to the recognition that for some of our students, even if you hand them a device, they're in a position where infrastructure, uh, digital infrastructure in their area is limited to the extent that that device is useless. So continue-ish teaching and assessment at UCT happened in light of these two spaces. The second thing that we did, which I think most institutions have done at this point, 
um, certainly that's what I'm hearing from Daniela and what I've heard from um, Raymond at NWU was a student survey. And I have to say that from the UCT perspective, the feedback that we got around that was that this was potentially the most direct data that staff have ever had about their students, particularly in the big undergraduate classes. Um, obviously in small postgrad classes, it's a different experience. The second decision, oh sorry, the third decision that was hard won and very challenging for academics across the university was a decision that all students would, for their transcripts, receive a pass-fail um, uh, indication rather than a grade with the exception of law and final year courses. And this was a really difficult kind of mountain to, to get over. Um, there were two more um, decisions that were made at an institutional level. One was that there would be a no cost voluntary withdrawal for students who felt like they could not continue with remote teaching and assessment during this time. And that there would be no academic exclusions on the basis of this. So that kind of is our big framework for what happened in terms of teaching and learning at UCT. And particularly, obviously, in terms of assessment. So we are almost at the end of our semester at UCT. We are in a position where um, most people are starting, if people opted to go with some kind of end of term test or exam, they're in that process now for like the next week and a half, 10 days. So in practice, where did we end up? The strongest advice we gave every single academic that we engaged with was consider your class. Economics at UCT with a group of 1,500 students or 1,600 students, which is our biggest group, is a very different proposition from my postgrad group with 20 students. So we always said to people, consider your class, figure out what are the possibilities for your group. There was a very strong and again, difficult impetus to accept that an open book student communication space was inevitable. So one of the things that, that UCT decided was that we wouldn't attempt even to use official lockdown browsers and that we wouldn't attempt electronic proctoring for a range of reasons, which we probably don't have, um, including issues around students feeling surveyed and stressed, uh, the cost of data, et cetera. So we encourage staff to accept the fact that this was now an open book space and that it was inevitable that students would communicate with each other in the background. And so we encourage people to move assessment away from testing memory or fact um, towards testing application or creative elements of their discipline. And that's been a really difficult and challenging move for many people. Um, and it's really highlighted the extent to which traditional examinations in the university still continue to focus on testing memory and fact. The other thing that we strongly encouraged was um, for staff to opt for a kind of dispersed regular assessment and where possible to reduce the weight of large assessments. How successfully these have been taken up is a different issue and I think uh, I want to echo what Daniela was saying which is that staff practices around assessment are very difficult to, uh, to, to shift. They're very grounded and very um, deeply rooted and it's actually quite hard to move them. Um, we encourage strongly that if people were going to use time quizzes, that they provide extended windows of time, offer multiple submissions and have a paper-based or email-based backup plan for these. We strongly recommend that there are no pop-up quizzes or assessments, but we have heard via the grapevine that sometimes these still happen. And then we had some really strong recommendations in terms of tech, which was choose your tech very carefully. Go for the lowest common denominator where you can. Trial all your tech formats in advance so nobody should face a new format of test in a new technology in an exam or a test scenario for the first time. And of course, as I said, no official lockdown browsers or proctoring. Despite all that, here's some of the feedback that we've had from students. So despite that, students are still saying to us, our assessments, our assignments open book. Um, how does the pass fail system work? Uh, we want more assessment, interestingly enough. Um, I'm assuming that students mean we want more formative assessment, um, a demand from students around uh, rubrics to accompany assessments, which again, staff have kind of resisted to some extent. And the idea that 
when the time limits really need to take into consideration not only data, but also that actually, disturbingly, our students type much slower than they write, um, which suggests that perhaps the uptake of digital prior to this was not as widespread as one would hope. So finally, what does this all mean for us? And I'll just stay with the slide for two minutes. Um, basically, it means a really serious rethink around the role and meaning of assessment, particularly in relation to quality. Um, and what that means for us is a focus on assessment for learning above everything else. The placement of assessment in a wider institutional culture that's a kind of an awarding culture, where assessment is not just on its own, but it's tied to NISFAS, to funding, to dean's list, to awards, and the fact that students care deeply about all of those. I think that assessment in this context has really highlighted a kind of trust gap that exists between students and staff, um, where the pedagogic relations and practices that underpin assessment frame student collaboration as cheating um, and don't allow a space for reframing that necessarily or for rethinking that. Um, I think that they've also heightened an awareness of the potential for flexibility in terms of students taking a test when they're ready and the awareness that not all assessment regimes work for, for all our students. And finally, I think this kind of assessment context has really heightened our awareness around non-academic factors that exacerbate the stress of um, assessment for students and that actually confound whether or not, kind of confound the results um, and make it difficult to assess whether or not the assessment in front of you reflects what a student does or doesn't know, or whether or not, quite frankly, their parents were having a fight in the background, or whether there was no food in the house that week. So, yeah, uh, and I think that's where I'm going to pause. And stop my share. So thank, thank you. you very much for allowing me to have a, a moment to say those things. Thank you, Nikki, and thank you to the whole task team. Thank you very much, Shanali. So I just also want to upgrade Rose. So as you can see, just as, just as a heads up, that um, I think many of us can, <laughs> you can see, we're also still learning. Um, and I'd like to just highlight that. So I'm even learning today about you know, the access to new accessibility features in Zoom and, yeah, and I guess many of us are facing that. that we're, we're learning as we go, and I think this webinar is, is also a testimony to that. So sort of the shared boat we're all in. Um, indeed. So, Ros, I've made you a, yeah. Rosaline, I've made you a co-host, so you should be able to introduce the next okay, speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Nicola, send, please check your email. I did send the slides to you, uh, prof slides. I don't want to handle that because I do have internet uh, problems here as well. Uh, to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Upasna Singh. She's a senior lecturer in the discipline of information systems at UKZN. She lectures on a wide range of IT related subjects and she has a keen interest in educational technologies. In 2019, she completed her fellowship in teaching advancement in universities from the Council of Higher Education. Her primary area of research is digital teaching and learning in higher education. Welcome, uh, Upasna, and over to you. Thanks, um, Rosaline. Um, thanks, Nicola. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be back here with the Hatasa team. Um, this is probably my first interaction with them since the TAO program. So it's good to see some familiar names on the list of attendees. And for those of you that are not familiar, hopefully we will become familiar with each other in the future. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share a little bit about my experiences um, with regard to the move to assessment or the online assessment uh, component of the remote teaching. Uh, I just want to state at the beginning that I'm not part of any of the policy decision makers at UKZM. So whatever I'm going to be sharing with you is based on my own experience coming from the facilitation side where I've been involved in training of staff in the use of our learning management system. 
So I tried to summarize the process um, into a simple uh, phased approach because that is the approach that was used at UKZN. Uh, when lockdown started um, at this point here, we, uh, I think like with many other institutions, there was simply a, an abrupt stop to academic activity at that point in time. So um, academics were left feeling um, that they, they didn't know where they were going to next. And there was a lot of panic that set in for those academics that were not familiar with the online mode of teaching and assessment practices. So at that point in time, what um, UKZN did was working together with staff and students like uh, we've seen from the other presentations was this, there was a great emphasis on needs analysis, which was the first part of the process. So understanding what staff knew and then what staff needed, what, uh, what stu or where students were, in other words, how would we gain access to them, what data um, access did they have, what technology access did they have. And then also there was a needs analysis of the actual infrastructure that we had at UKZN to support the online mode of assessment and teaching. And so um, the needs analysis was done at institutional level where institutional level surveys were sent out. And at the, I think we may have had about three or four that were sent out uh, quite regularly at different stages to gauge where we were at. And they were also done at school and college level. So you found that schools, um, because of the structure of the, at, at UKZN where we divided into colleges and then schools and then disciplines, school level uh, needs analysis were also being done to understand academic needs in terms of training and staff need, uh, and student needs in terms of accessing and reaching out to them. Uh, based on needs analysis that was done, uh, the empowerment sort of training sessions then started. So training happened through the facilitation of webinars where we started training staff on the tools that were available within the current learning management system and our learning management system that's prescribed is Moodle. So the focus on these tools was how they could be used to engage students in online activities. So for example, we looked at the use of the quiz tool and how the various types of questions can be created, how we can support students in the assessment process using quizzes, um, how you can take your written exams or your essay questions and put them onto a quiz and get them are marked on the screen so you can still convert that process to electronic. And then during the training sessions that were happening, and this took about five weeks or so, we were also involved in course material development. So um, there was a, a course that was run by another academic at our institution, Dr. Craig Blewett, which focused on the pedagogical aspects of moving to online teaching and assessment. And so both the technical sort of skills and the pedagogy was addressed during that empowerment stage. And additional support material was also provided. So instructional guides on, on the various tools that are available were then developed by our academic support unit. And for some of us, um, like myself and a few other colleagues, we developed uh, short training videos which was specific to the context of UKZN's Moodle interface. So what we covered and um, beyond that was also recorded in short video clips so that a staff that needed assistance with specific topics um, post to the session got that uh, additional assistance. And then we moved on to the pilot phase. And so the pilot phase was uh, just, I think it was in the last two weeks of May, where academics was start, were asked to start engaging with students to deliver lectures and to deliver mock assessments. So in that time, the needs analysis was then taken to a more realistic needs analysis because we would, the actual interaction was happening with the students at that point in time. We came up with 
similar issues to many other institute, institutions where the data um, access was a problem, even though data was rolled out, it hadn't reached some students. So even at that stage, the assessments were not moving in the direction that we expected them to, but it started the engagement process with the students. From the 1st of June, uh, we then started with the formal online teaching and assessment processes. Um, and I think that following this process here of doing the needs analysis, the training and the piloting, it also helped to buy us some time so that um, you know, no student actually gets left behind. And the focus now since the 1st of June is on the online assessment and the teaching process in such a way that students are not actually left behind. Um, while some assessments started or commenced around the 1st of June, we have now been told that formal assessments should be put on hold until the end of June. So we're waiting for further instructions. Um, it seems that at different schools, at different levels, if assessments have been covered already, uh, they can still be counted. But the whole focus has been on moving towards continuous assessment because there wouldn't be a formal um, sit down exam at the end of the year. So some of the lessons that we learned was that digital literacy was absolutely important. Um, staff needed to be taught the basic skills even when it came to assessments. So simply saying to them that you need to move to the quiz tool on Moodle to conduct your assessments doesn't help. They need assistance with how to set up those assessments, how to convert the assessments from written to online, the pedagogy, the settings, um, how to release marks, all of these they needed to be taught. With regard to the pedagogy, uh, what we have tried to focus on there is uh, that taking your assessments from a written paper and putting it onto um, a digital tool doesn't mean simply a cut and paste. You have to rethink the assessment process. You have to look at your multiple choice questions, for example, can you change those to more interactive or engaging questions? Because Moodle does offer different question types, and not just your traditional five option multiple choice questions. We also found that support was essential. So while we provided training, while we provided manuals, while we provided videos, when lecturers actually had to um, perform the task they needed support. So I would get emails post the sessions when lecturers were struggling to um, populate their quizzes or they had during the mock assessments done a quiz with students and then they didn't know how to release the marks or they had forgotten how to mark the essay type questions. And while we have an academic support unit available because uh, of the large number of queries those kind of mechanisms. What we've also learned is that uh, staff or academics need to have some sort of training on instructional design and so we have started compiling an instructional design guideline now to assist the academics in the move to online assessment and teaching. And then a major concern for our academics was the amount of time and effort that they're putting into this move to an online environment. Um, in a short period of time, um, how are they going to be rewarded in terms of performance management? So the, that's just in a nutshell of what's happened at UKZN. We find that we're at the stage where each school um, discipline on their own, sometimes at college level, are starting to design their own guidelines and processes that need to be followed for um, online assessment because each discipline is unique in the way in which they assess their students. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks very much, um, Upasana.
Um, it's very interesting to see what's happening across universities, that there are similar practices and then there's some things that are also different. Um, I will try uh, sharing prof. Okay, Rosaline, we've lost you. I see you've met, you've muted your mic. Hi, I'm trying to share prop slides. I don't know what happened to the mic. Oh, <laughs> let me try again. Okay. Okay. Awesome, we see it, yay. Can just make it bigger. Like full screen view. Awesome, thank you, Rosaline. So Opa, Rosaline will be controlling slides for you. So just if you can say next slide um, and then we can go from there. Thank you, Rosaline. And, uh, or are you introducing Opa? Yeah, yes, thank you all. Uh, and uh, sorry about the, <laughs> the mishap uh, colleagues. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, Yes, uh, at UNISA we uh, uh, received a an instruction from from above. Uh, our management made a decision that all venue based examinations should be converted to online uh, in order to to save the academic year. So students who would not be in a position uh, to 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 do to, to learn online uh, during the first semester and to take the examinations now in, during May and June, uh, we're given an opportunity to uh, transfer uh, the writing of the examinations uh, at the end of October, November, uh, free of charge. And so uh, in, in order to try and uh, accommodate the the current designs that were uh, included in the in the different uh, modules or courses in the institution, uh, we had to accommodate a number of different uh, examination formats, which uh, I will indicate later that uh, created a number of challenges for us. So, so we had uh, about three kinds of uh, multiple choice uh, questions that we had where. Uh, students will be able to download questions, complete the uh, assessment, and then uh, upload the, the, the documents. Uh, there were those that had to be done uh, uh, online uh, without leaving the machine, uh, where the, the questions were randomized, and, and others, uh, each student received a unique uh, question uh, based on a pool of uh, uh, questions on the on the on the uh, item bank. Then we had also uh, options of uh, take home uh, examinations where students will give students a, a paper and they could take uh, a, a number of days. It's effectively like your open book exams uh, to to do the assessment and then come back and upload it. Uh, and so there was a range of examination formats that were uh, allowed. Uh, 
uh, and that yeah came with the things we are about uh to we are down the third week of uh, examinations have already gone through and we are still uh, proceeding with the uh, examination thanks can i get the next slide please uh, so in in executing uh, those 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 plan uh, the there was a high demand for for training uh, asked by by academics because some of them had not used uh, online assessments before uh, and, and they were they were relying entirely on the venue based uh, examinations but students uh, as well uh, were not uh, okay with the, the new exam formats that uh, some lecturers uh, chose, and so they had also now to be to be uh, capacitated uh, to use those different kinds of exam formats. Uh, what what became uh, important was that we needed to look at the quality assurance processes uh, surrounding the examination process. We uh, with uh, challenges that we had in the past of uh, exam leakages, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. we had already had a certain regime of uh, quality assurance, and, and now that had to change to accommodate the uh, the online processes. I think uh, there were colleagues in the institution who were very um, worried. Uh, that uh, there could be large-scale hacking and of getting access to the exam paper, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the communication now to students about the changes uh, and uh, making sure that we accommodate all students, we don't leave any student behind, uh, became uh, uh, activities that uh, preoccupied us a lot. We had to take time uh, communicating to students, uh, creating videos, showing them how the different examination formats work and how they will access the paper and the like. Next slide, please. And so, and, and so we, we identified about three areas uh, of challenges. Uh, at the institutional level, uh, at uh, making uh, academics ready, and at making students uh, ready. Next slide, please. Right, at the institutional level, one of the issues was uh, around the scalability of the ICT infra infrastructure. Because uh, at examination, during examination times, the, the, as we have some large scale uh, papers that had to be written, and so the concern was how that will, how the system will scale up. Uh, and because we had little time uh, between when the decision was made to to go for online assessment and the the, the, the time for the assessment, uh, there was little time to do a stress testing. And that resulted in uh, at the point where when some examinations happened and we realized that there is uh, blockages that the, 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 the uploading uh, sections that, that is the front end of the of the of our LMS that we've made that we've customized uh, to upload and download uh, examination papers when it could not handle the load uh, we had to start shifting uh, examinations, uh, which which was yeah, kind of not nice for for students, and they they were not uh, happy about that. So the whole issues of uh, monitoring and uh, evaluation uh, processes uh, had to to be reviewed again, and we had to come up with new ways of doing that. Uh, we we now uh, as we are continuing. Uh, also now dealing with having to send issues for moderation and external examiners. We are using a large number of uh, ex external examiners and uh, linking them into our own in-house uh, systems for, for, for marking. Uh, it's, it's, 
is, is, is quite a, a, ch a challenge because in the past we would just we would have paper-based uh, submissions and we will send them out to, to our external examiners. Uh, some modules decided to make proctoring a requirement uh, and uh, as soon as we tried to implement that, the issues of the digital divide became, became uh, obvious uh, and, and some students were just struggling with it. So uh, uh, although we have not made a decision that will ban uh, proctoring, uh, but it is creating a huge challenge for us. Right, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, in terms of uh, academics, uh, as I've indicated, uh, some were, uh, had to come up with new examination formats, new ways of assessing students. And, and so we had to, through uh, our Center for Professional Development, have to uh, do capacity development workshops for a large number of people. Uh, and the the, the way that we prefer to do it in terms of uh, not, not having uh, canned presentations it was becoming a challenge because the number of requests for professional development uh, was, was, was high. And, uh, and we had to rely because we, we did not have access to the campus and things like that. We had to rely on uh, the technology tools that are available to in the institution and that was creating all sorts of uh, challenges. Next slide, please. The last issue was uh, to bring students uh, on, on board. Um, the, the, the assumption that, we, that was made was that students will be able to cope with the uh, online uh, environment uh, because it has been part of their of the education and the LMS, our learning management system has always been uh, something that students has to interact with, submit assignments, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but for, for some reason, uh, the, the students, uh, some of them struggled around this, this, this area uh, of having now to do formal uh, examinations uh, online. And uh, yeah. When, when slight things happen, like for instance, the, the, the system becomes a little bit slower uh, to interact with, they started panicking. Um, and for instance, they will then start emailing uh, a lot of people in the institution to provide them with their uh, assessment uh, artifacts. Uh, even though we've communicated uh, alternative ways of uh, submitting, uh, for some reason, uh, students uh, missed that, that thing. And so we are getting anecdotal information uh, that uh, some students are really uh, undergoing uh, stress or their stress levels are high because of this kind of assessment format that we've, that we've used and that they had to contend with. So uh, one of the a major lessons that we are learning uh, going into the second semester is to really uh, make certain that we take our students uh, along and uh, ensure that uh, they do not have a, a high level of, 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 of stress. Yes, so uh, unfortunately we had to plunge right into it and proceed with it uh, and, 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 and we, we are, uh, as, we, as people say, we are making changes and customizing how we do things uh, as we meet uh, uh, challenges. Yeah, thank you. Those were my key things that we've learned uh, at UNISA uh, in this time. Thank you. Thanks very much, Prof. Very insight, insight, insightful as well. Um, we've got 15 minutes to open up for some discussion. So if you, uh, Nicola and I will coordinate that as well. So if you have any questions to a particular panel member or a general question or a comment, you can pose it now. Um, you can raise your hands to ask a question. 
was the first taker. Yeah, Rosalind, we had lots of questions so far. Um, I couldn't catch all of them, but I got a couple. Um, okay. Quite a few about how folks are ensuring quality. Um, so perhaps uh, panelists would like to, I think that was, that was one of the dominant things um, that came up as well as that um, folks don't know what different institutions are using even what LMS. So maybe let's see if there are any takers on quality. Um, let me just quickly um, respond to, to how we go about quality at, at our university. Um, first of all, um, is that faculties are responsible um, for ensuring quality of the assessment. So um, we go down towards, uh, you know, the academic arrows which guides the, the university overall. And every faculty has got uh, its own quality assurance document, uh, which during COVID-19, they had to reconvene and readjust. So as you design your assessment, which necessarily does not mean it has to be the same continuous assessment for uh, another student in another school, for example, within the same faculty. Um, the quality assurance document comes into play, ensuring that there is an alignment with what the academic, the general academic rules says and the faculty says, and this assessment are then checked in that manner. That's, that's basically how we, so it lies with faculty and, and not the professional structure and not just what the lecturer also wants or thinks would work. Thank you, Raymond. Um, does any of our other panelists uh, want to respond about quality? Nicola? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's Shanali. Um, I think what's interesting at the moment is that we're having a lot of conversations, uh, I think particularly in non-public spaces, um, about quality for what or quality of what. Um, and I think that there is very much a concern around, is it quality in relation to whether or not the assessment reflects the richness and the depth of student learning, or is it quality in, in a very constrained sense around, we can say that the student wrote this test. Um, and I think that that conversation and the complexities around that are something that might be a really interesting outcome of the very difficult situation that we find ourselves in. So a question around what constitutes quality rather than just how do we ensure quality. Ta, thank you. Thank you, Shanali. And I suppose that can be a whole uh, session on its own, how people are defining and approaching quality. Um, so thank you for highlighting that uh, complexity. I think there was a really good question raised by Odwa, which is what support is given to academics during this period and who monitors burnout um, and depression? So maybe we can hand to some of our other panelists to respond to that one. Um, well, at, at the Northwest University, um, you know, it's difficult to, to say because one is not really involved in that, but um, there is a wellness, um, you know, department who has been uh, ensuring uh, to have conversations with lecturers that might be having um, stress levels and even students. And um, they also regularly share um, information regarding that on, on, on the university website and also send it directly to our email 
that uh, information on how tips and tricks, you know, on how to manage stress at, at the way you're currently doing your job. Um, that's, that's about it. Um, perhaps regarding detailed information on, as to the kinds of requests or issues that they've been dealing with, um, um, I fear I won't be able to do that. But yes, we, we do something regarding that. Thank you, Raymond. Um, yeah, I think universities all have uh, different uh, approaches uh, to to responding to staff staff stress. Uh, Rosaline, did you catch any questions that I might not have seen that were interesting? Yeah, I, I think there was an interesting uh, discussion that was taking place in the chat about cheating. And uh, there were some comments about why do students cheat and maybe we need to relook at our assessments and look at more collaborative ways of assessing students. So I don't know if the panelists have any ideas about that. I know Daniela had a response on the chat as well about students cheating and how do we deal with this um, in terms of changing the way we assess so students can maybe embrace more collaborative ways of um, working together on assessment tasks. Shall I answer here? I think, I mean, many of our conversations with lecturers are about how to redesign um, online assessments for, you know, remote teaching and learning, which is at home and which can't be um, invigilated the way it would be invigilated at, at the university. So there's this whole, and I think um, Shanali said it, that it's really a take home exam. and. What is fascinating, and I think somebody else has said that, that even though we have all these conversations and discussions and, you know, we, we give all this good advice, it is extremely different, difficult to move away from established practices. And, but I also think it's something that one will learn as, you know, you go along. This is a huge move for everyone. So I think people will get better at setting assignments and assessments for remote learning and they, they're learning. I mean, from each, um, from each response, from each completion, people learn and adjust and change. So I think it's a really interesting space in terms of assessment. And I mean, I, we've had this conversation in the chat. If, if we believe or we know assessment drives learning, it shouldn't, but it does in our context. So if, a, if, if the assessment type even changes a little bit as it does right now, it might actually have some interesting impact on learning. For me, that's really something that I'm very interested about and how, how learning changes in this um, time because of the changed assessment practices. Yeah, I think I'll leave it there. Yeah, thank you, Daniela. Is there any other panel um, panelist would like to res respond to that? Yeah, yeah, and, and, and also from a from a practical from a monetary perspective. <laughs> uh, sorry, because we, we, we have having to deal with a large number of students to, to try and have uh, systems like uh, turn it in, etc. etc. for large number of students for, for, for examinations. It's just it's just yeah, a, a huge a huge burden. But the the the, the real uh, idea is that we, we need to be able um, to, uh, through using continuous assessment uh, principles and assessment for learning principles, uh, help students uh, not to rely on, on trying to, to cheat, but on, on, on using the, the learning experience uh, uh, as, 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 as part of their of, 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 their, of their development, and, and as such, the, the, the need really to, uh, to to focus on uh, you know cheating exercises becomes uh, meaningless. Uh, but but one of the one of the uh, challenges that we we had to contend with uh, as well was uh, uh, academics saying that but our professional bodies uh, would like to have this kind of uh, assessment and, and, and not have uh, another kind of assessment. So trying to juggle between the, the needs of uh, academics and the, the, the professional bodies is also something that we, we need to navigate through to ensure that 
uh, we, we manage the expectations uh, across the board. Thank you. Um, Thanks, well, if, Rob. I can add something. I, I, yeah, yes, Raymond, go ahead. Add something there is that this is really a big change, you know, and we, we, we just, from my own perspective, the, the most important thing is to really see how one can reduce cheating. I do not think from a behavioral perspective that cheating can actually um, stop in totality. But then if one goes into um, putting a whole lot of developmental skills, developmental opportunities into how to design assessment in a way that it allows the students to really submerge themselves into dealing with those assessment might be a, a way forward. So, and the, the, the critical question is how then do, do one elevate using higher order questioning, you know, using open book examination and relating that with, you know, um, how the students actually, um, or, or let me say what the level descriptor says, so that you do not go against, against the theories that applies to assessment. But I, I really think it's towards the design at this point. Thank you, Raymond. I, I think there was an issue uh, raised about students coming from disadvantaged communities and also taking into consideration learning spaces. So students are coming from these disadvantaged communities, but we're setting these assessments for them, which they expected to complete uh, within that that space that they have with all the diff different challenges that they face. So how can we approach this when it comes to assessment? How do we take these factors into consideration when we are designing our assessments? Anyone from the panelists? Can I, can I go in there? Yes, Raymond, go ahead. Um, that's why we created the Winter School. Um, which would happen in a duration of two to three weeks. Uh, for students, even though we, we, you are a paper-based contact student, we still expect that there's going to be challenges. It's possible you did your assignment and you couldn't career it back, or something was lost in the way, or um, you never even got the paper-based. Um, you know, we, we, we're given opportunities for them to come on campus and the, the university is setting up facilities um, on the guidelines, on national guidelines of lockdown to allow them come in for that duration to complete the assignment. We also believe that some ass assessment cannot really be com completed, um, you know, on a remote platform. They still have to come um, or be carried over. So if we don't want to carry over, we, we're also going to give opportunities to those students to come in and uh, finalize the assessment within that period uh, before coalition of all this assessment is done and published. Uh, so that's our own approach. Thanks, thanks Raymond. Nicola? Yeah, I just want to highlight, um, just to folks, thank you for the heads up about the permissions on that uh, feedback form. So please share your feedback with us on the session uh, using this link. I know we've got two minutes left. We had a really um, fascinating discussion and I know we didn't even get time to attend to all the, wo the wonderful questions that you've had. But I also want to raise that there are many institutions who have publicly available resources. And in a recent uh, you know, guide shared by the CHE where they were collating resources, um, we found that there's a, there, there are not many South African university uh, links there. Um, for me, this was quite disappointing. So I thought if we could curate um, publicly available resources from our institutions and share this, that would really be great. And we can share it back with them so I'm going to share the link to that. Uh, and as given the conversations we've had today, I've also included a column for LMS. So we don't know what uh, you know learning management system the different our different universities are using. So you can enter you can enter that here as well. Um, so yeah, 
Um, just going to share the link here. Uh, Rosaline, anything else? Yeah, it's, you know, we've raised, there's lots of issues and I don't think we have got answers. It's just more, lots and lots of issues, lots of challenges and assessment. And as we speak about it, we see that, yes, we have got common issues across institutions and we're all facing the same type of issues. Um, so it's all a learning curve. And I think we are a community and we're here to support um, each other as a community and sharing resources as Nicola is speaking about sharing our resources with each other as well. Um, but yeah, but there's lots of issues that have come up and in your feedback, if you could please write down what are some of the future topics you'd like us um, as health tasks to plan forward on, uh, we'd like to even get your input on that. So I would like to say, I know we've got um, no time left. Thank you on behalf of uh, Health Asa, um, for spending your time with us and sharing your ideas. I didn't have the time to read all the comments in the chat, which I will do after this meeting. And we will make the recording available to everyone as well. So you can sit back and just listen in and, and you know, uh, on what was said during um, the session. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Anthea, Rita, our conveners. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deltasa Executive. Thank you, Nicola, for hosting us on your Zoom platform today. And have a great afternoon, everyone. Over to you, Nicola. Thank you, Rosaline. And thank you for you. And as well, you know, this is a team effort. Um, and I think, uh, and it was quite chaotic with so many people, but also a lot of fun. Uh, Kasturi, would you like to say anything? I've upgraded you to co-host um, as the president of Altasa. Maybe you want to share something? Yep, and maybe you don't have a mic, um, but that's totally fine. Um, thank you, colleagues, for joining us, and we look forward to hosting interesting, you know, future webinars. So let us know in that feedback form, um, and take care, everyone.